I'm sitting there going, but what are the athletes going to do when they get a DM to go and photograph the product? And and everyone kind of looks at me like, well, that's what's going to happen. Like Nike's going to sign them to a deal. And I was like, no, like they're all going to become social media influencers overnight. How can we provide our student athletes with resources, templates? This is how you can respond to a DM. This is what you can think about when you're creating content. Okay, once you create that content for a brand, how are you following up? How are you maintaining that relationship? Hello and welcome to About Time, the show where we have long overdue conversations about the journey of women in sports. I'm Marky Freeman, author, athlete, fan of sports, and an even bigger fan of the women who are changing them. Today's guest knows about all things NIL and holds a unique title that gives us visibility into careers in sports beyond playing and coaching. Taylor Jacobs is the Associate AD of NIL and Strategic Initiatives at LSU. Not only is LSU a powerhouse when it comes to NIL, but Taylor leads an all-female team that makes the magic happen. We're so excited to welcome Taylor to the show. Before we get into our interview with Taylor, a quick word from We Coach. This interview is brought to you by We Coach. Prior to Title IX, over 90% of women collegiate sports teams were coached by women. Today, over 50 years later, that number has decreased to 41%. That's why We Coach launched Move the Numbers to help change the landscape for women coaches and the student athletes they lead. We Coach is a one of a kind nonprofit membership organization dedicated to recruiting, advancing, and retaining women coaches in all sports and levels through year round professional growth and leadership development programs. We Coach fosters a diverse and inclusive community of over 10,000 coaching leaders who inspire young women to follow in their footsteps. If she can see her, she can be her. Together, we move the numbers to support and increase women in coaching. We teach, we inspire, we motivate, we lead, we coach. Visit our website at wecoachsports.org. That's wecoachsports.org. Hey, I'm Taylor Jacobs, and it's about time to teach you how to tell your story. It can be so hard for young girls and women in sports to see a path forward. And a lot of times simply because they don't know that there are opportunities available to them outside of just playing or even just coaching. How did you become familiar or educate yourself on the, the diverse roles and careers that are available inside sports? Yeah, that's a great question and a great point. I think that so many people in the younger generation don't understand everything that goes on behind the scenes within an athletics department or a professional team or any of those kind of departments. But what happened with me, I was a student athlete at Auburn and I was very familiar with our athletic department. So when I was going through my student athlete experience, I made it very clear to our administration and my coaches that, hey, I think I wanted to stay in sports, but I didn't really know what that looked like. I was a communication major. I thought I was going to go into sport broadcasting. So I was still kind of entertaining that idea. But if that fell through, then what would it look like if I did something behind the scenes on a campus? So I took on any and every internship I could while I was playing. Um, Auburn allowed me to intern in the marketing department. I interned in the, in the academic department within athletics at Auburn and tried a few things within our foundation at the time. So tried to learn as much as I could. And then when I graduated, there was actually a recruiting position available within compliance. And I was able to step into that role, super thankful for that opportunity. So that allowed me to learn a lot more about compliance. So it truthfully was just, I I was throwing things at the wall and was seeing what was going to stick. And I interned in all of those different areas and determined, yes, I really like this or no, I, I'm looking for more of something in this area. Ended up landing in compliance, which I love all my compliance folks, probably wasn't my favorite thing because I couldn't be as creative as I am, you know, as a human. And I learned after I finished playing that I'm really creative and I have this creative side, um, but long term and ended up working out because now I've been able to, you know, step into the NIL role and be extremely creative here. So that's been my piece of advice for all of our students is don't hesitate to reach out and talk to people within the department. Learn as much as you can as what each unit does and don't be afraid to try different areas. You know, work for me, work for me for a semester go work for marketing for a semester, go work for the ticket office for a semester, go work for compliance and see what you think will best suit you as a person because they're all such different areas. 
comms major over here, broadcasting as well is my trade, but also to hear how versatility adds value, how all of those experience helped you create the career that you're in right now. And now this is an introduction to careers that didn't necessarily exist until here recently. What are some of those careers or opportunities that have evolved from the NIL space? Oh man. I mean, you can look at NIL. NIL has been impacting, you know, fundraising. So the development arm of an athletic department or the fundraising aspect, corporate partnerships, and which also kind of falls under fundraising compliance. There's a lot of, there's still a lot of rules and things to navigate the marketing and branding and creative side of things. We have that within our little army of students. We have a little creative unit, that storytelling component. So so broadcasting without being in front of a camera all the time, really. But there's a lot of areas I feel like people are finding they were involved in and now they're getting into NIL. Or I have a lot of students who have worked with us in NIL and now they're saying, wow, I could go do a lot of things now outside of this. And you may have had some of these experiences too, Taylor, but for me personally, when basketball ended for me collegiately, when that ball stopped bouncing, there was a bit of anxiety because that was a passion of mine and something that I had experienced for so long and I did not want it to end, but was totally unaware of all the opportunities that were available for me to stay with sports, for me to stay around the game. And so we need more girls, we need more women around sports to stick around as well. And so so you guys, LSU, you guys are the powerhouse in the NIL space. I want you to talk a little bit about your team, which consists of all women. Let me add that first and foremost, but how do you guys set these student athletes up to be successful? First, let me say LSU being a powerhouse in NIL, that's because our student athletes are incredible. We have an amazing group of Females, I mean, let's be real, our female <laughs> teams are kicking butt right now, but also all of our student athletes and all of the stuff surrounding NIL is because of them. But within the department, we made it a huge priority before all of the laws passed with NIL that we wanted to be proactive and think about what are the areas that athletes are going to be impacted and where are they going to need education and guidance. And so I was very intentional with building this program around that. And that's where my unique social media experience kind of was able to merge with my compliance and athletics world because we were sitting at a table prior to the state law passing and our senior administration and our AD and some of our our more established staff members, I'm sitting there going, but what are what are the athletes going to do when they get a DM to go and photograph the product? And and everyone kind of looks at me like, well, that's what's going to happen. Like Nike's going to sign them to a deal. And I was like, no, like they're all going to become social media influencers overnight. They're all going to be getting DMs. They're going to be flooded with opportunities in that space. So how are we thinking about that? And that was truthfully how a lot of our education was was born, right? How can we provide our student athletes with resources, templates. This is how you can respond to a DM. This is what you can think about when you're creating content. Okay, once you create that content for a brand, how are you following up? How are you maintaining that relationship? And then that has truthfully evolved into our networking and building those longer term relationships because you can transition this from NIL to a job. We've collaborated a ton with our student athlete development group. They're called Tiger Life on our campus. Because this message, it really does tie in. And if a student athlete does NIL right, they can build relationships that last long beyond your career and take you into a potential job. And we want them to think about that, right? And even if these relationships don't carry into a career or a job for them, at least they have the experience of you know, going back and forth on a contract and having those professional conversations as to what content they need to deliver and maintaining a deadline when it comes to delivering that content. And again, all things that I have to do now for LSU athletics in my working world life, it's very similar with NIL. So while to some extent you're asking them to grow up a little bit faster, right? You're asking them to step into a job much sooner than they probably anticipated. A lot of them are having fun with it and they can definitely have fun with it. The fact that you guys are teaching these players not just how to cash in on their fame, but also how to build long-term connections that are gonna, gonna help them far beyond the sport and well after they use 
leave LSU is just phenomenal. But for any athlete, male or female, regardless of what institution they are at, why is it important for any athlete of any caliber to build their brand or their identity for themselves? Prior to NIL, pre-NIL, as we say, we all thought and we would all tell our student athletes, and I remember them telling us, you know, don't put anything on social media you wouldn't want your grandma to see. And people took that with a grain of salt. But now people are seeing the value of a brand because names are recognizable across the world and deals are coming through and people are tracking on what's going on. I mean, we have probably some of our student athletes names are more recognizable than their team might be. I know people who have come to me and said, oh, you know, Angel Reese is a student athlete at LSU or Olivia Dunn is a student athlete at LSU. What sports do they play? So they know who they are, but they don't always resonate that they're an athlete. And be because of this brand that they built and this platform that they have. And so I think just the value of how you're presenting yourself as a collegiate athlete and especially right now as a female athlete, let me tell you, I feel like we, I don't know when you graduated, but I missed my time. Like I missed my prime, I feel like, because now the platform that female athletes have and women's sports have is incredible. So combine that with a strong, powerful, positive brand that's going to create lasting impact. I mean, not only would you set yourself up for NIL success, but you're going to set yourself up for success after you finish, because to your point, I finished playing tennis and I sat there for probably three days and was like, I don't know what to do with my hands anymore. I don't know what to do. And now we have student athletes leaving campus, some of whom have built such an elaborate social media following that they're just going to go continue to use their platform. And some of whom through all of this have said, you know, I love broadcasting because I get on my Instagram stories all the time and now I want to go get in front of a camera and that wasn't what they were doing when they started college. You know, like they're learning more about themselves as they develop a brand because they're truly taking time to understand who they are, what's important to them, and what do they truly stand for. And ultimately, that's the college experience, right, Taylor? <laughs> it's about preparing them. Your college experience to cat catapult you into your career or <laughs> catapult you into your better self while maturing you and growing you. I think we would all love to know what some of those best practices are for individuals who are seeking to go into the NIL space. Yeah, so what we typically do with an athlete who comes into our office and says, hey, I want to get I want to get in the NIL game. The first thing we do is we sit down with them and we have what we call a brand identity meeting. So it'll be me, my staff or my staff and the athlete. And we'll all sit together in a room and we will walk the student athlete through this brand identity practice and determine what are your core values? What is your niche? What are your buckets of content that you want to focus on? So for example, we just did this with a volleyball student athlete and she's extremely passionate about food. Like she was like low key. I'm a foodie. I really like food. I want to post about food. And I was like, great. That's awesome. Okay. So you're passionate about volleyball. You're passionate about food. What else are you really passionate about? She's really passionate about music. So, okay. How can we take those concepts and help you create content that you can then build off of, right? So now she's posting her her competition playlist every time before they compete. So, and her goal is to work with a headphones company by the end of you know the semester. So there's different ways that you can implement all of those things. So we'll start with a brand identity meeting. And then from the brand identity meeting, we take them to the brand strategy meeting because once you understand who you are, what your content buckets are, what your core values are, now you can take that and you can start to target companies and brands that you want to work with based on the content that you you will most likely be putting out. And we do all of this because we really want our athletes to stay true to who they are as an individual. I never want an athlete to come to campus and say, well, my teammate is posting her makeup routine every day, so I should do that. Okay, do you wear makeup? And if the answer is no, you shouldn't do that because that's not true to who you are. But if you go and get a coffee every day while she's doing her makeup, you talk about your coffee. Let her do her makeup, but you do your coffee. And so helping them understand that you don't have to do what everyone else is doing, but staying true to who you are, finding what's important to you, and then targeting brands, businesses, NIL deals from there, that will help you be successful because you will you will be more organically engaged with the business if it's something you're truly passionate about. And in turn, the business will most likely be pleased because of the content that you put out.
You guys are operating at the intersection of their passions, their desires, things that are actually enjoyable for them. When you say the word targeting businesses, are you actively pursuing them or are you waiting for them to come to the student athlete? How does that work? Um, both. So I have someone okay. on my staff who she does, she reaches out to businesses, both in the Baton Rouge area and surrounding areas, more so to educate them on NIL and the values of it, the benefits of it, what they could do with it, what they could get out of it. Then if the business is interested, we will fur we will make introductions between them and the student athlete. So we aren't necessarily going out on behalf of one particular athlete, but more so on behalf of just NIL as a whole and seeing if the business is interested. And then if they are, we can help make the introduction to the student athlete. But I will also say a lot of our student athletes take into their own hands. They want to go and pitch the businesses. They are very passionate about, you know, using their voice, practicing the communication, so we will, in those brand strategy meetings, help them understand what a brand pitch, a strong brand pitch looks like so that they can then take that and implement it in a real life scenario and they'll pitch the brand themselves. Now, is this, this strategy meeting, are these strategies something that are introduced to all student athletes or just the athletes that express interest in NILs? Um, both the ones who express interest and come and meet with us definitely get it on a deeper level because they're coming to one on one sessions. But we do incorporate all of this into our team by team and our big group session education. It's just you're probably getting a lot more hands on when you come to our office and set up an appointment. But I mean, to this up to this time, we've met with several, you know, student athletes one on one from all sports. And they're all going out and implementing different things. So I just now have the staff. I and mean, we really started doing that last semester because I hired my second person in January of last year. So or January of this year, I guess. So um, that process really got going in the spring semester. So hopefully, you know, the athletes will start to realize, you know, the more they come see us, the more fun they'll have. Honestly, this, this is the cheat code, Taylor. This yeah. is the cheat code. At this point, I don't know if I have any eligibility at all, but I feel <laughs> like it's worth just double checking because opportunities have been missed at this point. You have talked a lot about social media as well and how that can be maximized. And early on, especially in my day, it was always said, like, don't post anything that could cost you your scholarship. Mm -hmm. How can social media or other things be detrimental to one's name, image, and likeness? So I think a couple of reasons. I think one, people aren't always careful with it. So if you go out and you are at a party and you, you engage in something that hopefully you're of age to engage in and that spurs you to post something that you might not post, right? You could get in trouble there because we've seen countless videos where people post videos of themselves or someone else saying something that they otherwise probably wouldn't say, but they're under the influence. So that is, that's scary. And we tell them all the time, think about that. Like you don't need to, one, be careful going out in general. And two, be careful what, when you get in a comfortable situation, what, what you're putting out there, because sometimes things are misinterpreted. Two, I truthfully think the the mental health component and what our what just this generation in in general deals with with social media can be hard. I think that the comparison game is real. It's painful for me to to watch people come in and say, "Well, I don't have as big of a following as him or her, and so I'm just not going to get anything." Well, that is not true at all. And that is hard for I think a lot of people to get past because I think it originally it was this vision of I have to have however many thousands of followers and I have to be verified and you know that's how I'm going to make money which is not the case in fact the micro influencer is one of the most sought after people for marketing companies and market and mar business marketing so um trying to help them see past that and not get so hung up on the numbers and the verification um you know I think social media can be a great place. And I think it's an incredible place that you can go and express yourself and show your creativity and who you are. But I also think that it can be 
a little bit of a like sucks your soul out a little bit because you get so into you get so into it and you you know the I've heard the term a lot you don't ever stop the scroll which is true people just you see everyone's always on their phone I'm guilty of it I have to go home at night and put my phone down and say I'm not getting on it because it can be intoxicating so I think it's that fine line right I want to do NIL but I don't want to be so ingrained in my social media that I can still like separate myself. But I also want to be on social media in a positive light because there's a lot of eyes on me and I want to reflect myself and my brand positively. First off, I think that's so important to speak to because social media can be totally mishandled. And when you're talking about a brand, there is a protection that comes with that. And there's a certain level of maturity and, and good decisions that need to be made to protect that brand at all times. And, and Taylor, you've spoken to so many different elements that go into NILs. It's far beyond just image. We have to, yes, protect that image, but there's also managing mm -hmm. those relationships and those connections with NILs, which you hinted to earlier. How do you maintain or keep those NIL deals? You know, I think that goes back to the the relationship piece, right? I think the more you work with a business and you produce quality content or you're respectful and you're showing up on time, you're following up with a thank you, you're sending the content that you posted, you're posting something extra. Those are going to be things that make a business say, we loved working with that individual and we want to work with them again. So that's an easy way to hopefully maintain and replicate deals. But also this industry is smaller than people think. And the more you work with companies, the more companies talk about you on the back end too. So the better rep representation of yourself you have with one brand, the better you most likely will be moving forward with another brand. Because if said brands have the same owner and they're just partnered under the same group, you don't want one brand to go to another and that one brand say, oh, they were terrible. They didn't show up for their appearance. They were disrespectful. You know, th they didn't do anything we asked. Then the second brand is not going to reach out to you. And again, very similar to an employer, right? We all have, when I hire people, I have their their references and I call their references. And it's the same kind of thing with NIL. You need to be careful that your quote references would give you a good reference. So how are you conducting the work? How are you showing up? Similar to how you show up at practice, you need to show up at 100% every day, right? We always say that. You need to bring it all. You need to leave it all on the court or the field or in the pool, wherever you are. You need to do that with NIL because then that will help you down the road with future deals. Yeah, and, and you said it multiple times, you've used the word work. And I know for me personally, as a student athlete, being a student athlete at any level, let alone the division one level, as well as maintaining your studies, and now you have this work, what kind of complications can that create? Is LSU doing anything specifically to try to create just like a safe space and make this transition of NILs more comfortable for the student athletes? Yeah, I mean, we hope within our office, you know, we help them to understand their time management better. We definitely try to teach them that it's on the athlete to present to the brand what their schedule looks like and what they can and can't do. For example, if a brand reaches out to... I'll use football right now. They're in season. If a brand reaches out to one of our football student athletes and asks them to come to four appearances by the end of November and an autograph session, well, realistically, you're in season and it's okay for you to go back to this brand and say, hey, I'm actually in the peak of my season right now. So this is going to be really hard for me to deliver on. Is there any way we can be flexible with those dates? And nine times out of 10, the business is going to respect that. If they can't respect it because it's a timely campaign, then they'll pivot to an athlete who's not in season. And I think it's being upfront about that. Again, that'll help the athlete. It'll help you as an athlete manage your time, help the the business understand, okay, they're in season. Like we need to be respectful of that as well. Um, but it'll also just help the industry in general understand because I think where these businesses and these brands were working with the influencers on the social media world, those people weren't student athletes. So they didn't have the schedules that the student athletes do have now. So 
the more they start to work with student athletes, the more they'll begin to be respectful of, okay, they're in season versus out of season hours. And what does that look like? So, um, you know, and I think, yeah, we always try to reiterate to our athletes, like protect yourself and your time first, your time is valuable. So not only do you need to, if you, it's okay to say no, but don't be afraid to charge for your time. If you're, if a brand reaches out to you and wants a huge video shoot and a bunch of content, that's time you're adding to your schedule. And if you need to charge for that, you need to charge for that. So, I mean, part of it, not always what brands want to hear, but it is part of it. A lesson to learn. And it's so phenomenal that athletes are getting this experience so early on, because what I've just learned from what you said, Taylor, is that your brand is a business. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and to learn that these athletes are having these conversations, navigating these conversations and connecting and maintaining these relationships on their own, that's a business mm -hmm. while being a student athlete. So shout out to all of these young ladies, but there is a lot of money involved, okay. a lot of money involved. And you guys are the powerhouse of sports. You guys are also the powerhouse in NILs, Taylor, and it's led by you. But just speaking on a number of the young ladies that are said to be some of the, the top leaders in NIL deals from Olivia Dunn, a gymnast, gymnast at LSU, Angel Reese, women's basketball coming off a national championship, Flage, right? Okay. Angel Reese was just quoted saying this, and she could potentially be one of the top, one of the top WNBA prospects coming out of the 2024 class if she wanted to. Only a junior right now, but she very well could be. She was quoted saying this, I am in no rush to go to the league. The money I'm making is far, is far more than some of the women in the league and maybe even some of the top players. Now that's a bold statement, Taylor, but it's very true. How does these larger NIL deals impact amateur and professional sports for women? You know, I, I think, again, there's this, there's always been this separate, clear separation of college versus professional and professional warranted all of these dollars and all these things. But if you really want to look at this past year, who was the most talked about person in the women's basketball world? <laughs> Angel Reese. Absolutely, Angel Reese. <laughs> so that said, she deserves to market herself to that same caliber. And I'm honestly very proud of everything that she has done. Um, she's taken a lot of her NIL opportunity and she's given back to her, uh, her school in Baltimore. And then also she's working on some things in Baton Rouge. So she's been incredible. Livy has the Livy Dunn Fund through the collective in Baton Rouge. So I think, you know... The, that separation is, I don't, I guess, going away. And I don't know if it's just because the collegiate platform, to me, there's more eyes on college athletes than there are professional sports now. So it's almost shifting. Um, and I'm, you know, I'm not really surprised by it. And I'm, I'm proud of them for, for everything that they're doing and, you know, standing in that light. And with that being said, along with these huge deals that are being made, some of them of millions of dollars, is there financial support or a financial education that's taking place as, as well that's available to the student athletes? Absolutely. So we, prior to NIL, so pre-NIL era, we would conduct financial literacy probably once or twice a year. Um, once the laws passed, our state law in particular actually has a mandated number of hours that we have to at least provide to our student athletes. So we bring our financial literacy partner onto campus two to three times a semester and then twice in the summer. So they meet with teams individually, team by team every time they're on campus. And then they're also available for our student athletes to meet with via Zoom. So we've definitely increased the hours. Most of our coaches have selected that their team has to meet with the, our partner every time they're on campus. So you're, they're getting, you know, anywhere from four to six sessions a year, just focusing on financial literacy. Um, and they'll they'll cover a range of topics, right? It'll be anything from opening a checking account to how you're saving your NIL money to preparing your taxes, but they're still having a bigger financial conversation so that they know how to prepare um, and what to think about in this space. Additionally, one of the biggest pieces of feedback that we got in year one, the most common thing I heard was, I had no idea taxes were that much. Like I had no idea. 
Like one of my student athletes was like, I just thought I would have to pay a couple hundred dollars. And I was like, how many, how many dollars did you make this year? Like, no, we give that away for sure. Um, so what we did in our new app that we just launched, there's a finances tab. So it tracks their total earnings. So everything that's been disclosed through the app, they'll have a total of what they earn. So let's just say, you know, athlete earned a hundred thousand dollars. They'll be able to see that. And then it'll also give them an estimate of what they should withhold for taxes. So it's not guaranteed because every athlete files in a different state, but it at least gives them a visual to think about like, oh, my taxes number could be much higher than what I initially thought. And I think Angel even recently said that in an interview too, was like, you, that you didn't re- we didn't realize that that much money went back you know, to the government, like in taxes. And that's a big thing, right? Like they don't know. And I don't blame them for not knowing. I probably didn't know until I got married and my husband sat me down and said, "Um, babe, rein it in on the credit card. (laughs) So now I think that they can have that visual in the app and then us getting in front of them as much as we are in financial literacy. We're constantly asking our coaches to remind them. We send out conversations and texts and message blasts and education in the app. So they're, they're getting all of that too. Um, so just trying to hit them with as many reminders as we can so that they can be thinking about it. But yes, a lot of financial literacy education. Ahead of the ball, just ahead of the game. And I can think for me personally, having had the opportunity to play professional basketball, nobody ever sat me down with a fin- financial literacy course and broke down taxes and broke down what needed to be paid back right? by percentage and how to manage your money and all of that good stuff. Mm-hmm. And so when you compare the two, that's something that you guys are doing very, very well. You mentioned a app that you guys created at LSU. I would love to hear more about that. So this stemmed from, you know, within the first six to eight months of NIL, there were a ton of companies out there that were getting into the space and they had the newest and best platform. And while all were really good platforms, I felt as if none of them quite met the expectation or the need that I had in giving our student athletes the best education, the best community and network, and just cleanest and easiest platform to navigate. Also, we try to streamline things. Like our athletes have a lot of things that are on their phones and education they're getting and forms they're doing. So trying to consolidate as much as possible. Um, So there was a group in town called Matchpoint, and they actually had developed a marketplace, which was an app. Again, it was a great platform, but it was just a marketplace. Um, We worked with them because they're local in Baton Rouge, and they ended up putting a a plan together. And I guess you can say they they impressed us the most. Um, But we worked with them to enhance that. And I just brought to them this is my vision and this is the things that I would want to add so that our athletes have custom education. So we make all of our educational videos and we put them in there. So it's consistent with how we are educating them throughout the year. Um, We have requirements like there's videos they have to watch before they can engage in a deal. There's videos they have to watch when they're requesting the use of IP. So we're able to trigger those so that the athletes have to watch them before they can take that next step. Um, The finances tab tracks their total earnings, gives them the estimated withholding. And then the profile is more of an enhanced profile where they can add more about themselves and market themselves better. We teach them a lot about what's in your Instagram bio and what are you sharing about yourself? And so this allows them to customize their profile a little bit more um, and take that a step further so that a business can learn more about them as they're as they're navigating NIL. So you've also helped pilot go time. Okay. as well as build your board, I believe is the name of it, which mm-hmm. are resources that you provide not only for the student athletes, but also for coaches, administrators, where a number of professionals come in and share everything from uh, their perspective on branding. Some of the largest social media networks work with you guys, hundreds mm-hmm. of business professionals. You guys have piloted all these outstanding programs. What has your work discovered to be the most, I guess, unknown information to the masses when it comes to NIL deals? So the beginning go time, that one, that stemmed because we had so many questions from businesses and they were all going, what do we do? And so I said, you know what, let's invite you all to Tiger Stadium and we will have a night to just talk about NIL. We had probably over 500 businesses for that first one. And it was 
strictly just to say, how do you get involved? LSU supports you engaging in NIL deals, things to think about when it comes to use of IP and all of that. Um, so that was just, you know, the general questions of NIL. They've since evolved into more IP usage, campus usage. What can I do with this commercial versus this photo shoot? Um, those tend to be a lot of the the questions. But I mean, the most asked questions from businesses are, who should we work with? And so what better way than to bring those individuals on campus, let them meet our athletes at these different events. Build Your Board is the perfect example. It's based on networking. So we want our student athletes to network with individuals in their field of study, but also be able to talk about NIL. And so it's a great night where all of our athletes and these businesses come together and they can they can meet them for themselves. Because I can get on any podcast and any article and say, the athletes at, at LSU are the best. You should hire them. Come see me if you want to hire them. But until they really meet them and get to know them, they don't they don't see it for themselves. And so I wanted them to come onto campus and see how great they were and um, be able to interact with them. And so that was what, you know, really stemmed those events. So Taylor, at LSU, you guys are literally putting your student athletes, coaches and administrators in rooms with businesses to network and connect. Right. <laughs> That's the cheat code. And, and getting, <laughs> <laughs> getting ahead of the ball has allowed you guys to position your players in a very, very special way for athletes, for parents, for administrators, for coaches who are listening in right now. What are some resources that you would recommend for them? Well, for parents, be familiar with your state law because we still have so many different state laws and I'll meet with recruits all the time and they'll have questions and, you know, I'm I'm pretty up to speed on most of the state laws, but it's very hard for me to keep track of how often Texas changes theirs and Florida changes theirs. Um, so definitely there's only 50. There's only yeah, 50 of them. So. Only 50, right. <laughs> uh, but definitely be up to date on your state law. And then outside of that, for coaches, wherever you are, I would definitely find who the point point of contact is for NIL on your campus. And I understand that not every institution has this right now, but figuring out who that person is and talking to them about ways that you can hopefully enhance those opportunities for your student athletes. Because again, I've talked to a lot of people who've stepped into the NIL role, and I don't think everybody thinks about the grand scale of things and the number of athletes. You know, I was an Olympic sport athlete. So I came from that, you know, smaller team, shout out to my women's tennis players out there. But thinking about how that team is marketed so differently than our women's basketball team or our football team or our baseball team. So be thinking about those kind of things. And as a coach, what I would say is don't be afraid to find that point person and share your voice because I learn things from our coaches every day. It's helpful for me to hear what the beach volleyball world is doing in this space and how our coaches are seeing things that I might not be seeing when they're on the recruiting trail. So having those conversations, bringing up those points, not being afraid to share that is very helpful. Um, and it also helps us as administrators make our NIL programs better, right? Because the more I know, the more I can implement into our own space. I think it starts with finding your administrator and, and getting on the same page there. And then that's how you can build out the best resources within your unit. And, and you have worked with a number of phenomenal athletes who hold some major NIL deals on both sides, right? On the male and the female side, but speaking specifically to female athletes, how does this better position girls and women in sports and how does this better position them post sport? Well, I think, Again, there's so many more eyes on female sports and women in sports right now. And I think the ability for them to market themselves beyond their sport and show who they are outside of basketball or outside of tennis or outside of gymnastics really showcases that these female athletes are so much more than athletes. Um, we have some who have incredible platforms They've given back to different groups within, you know, our our community. They've used their platform so positively. I just think this is a great time and an exciting time to bring more eyes into female sports and women's sports um, and female athletes. So it's been super exciting. 
um, moving beyond their careers. I think for us specifically, our female student athletes are very active on the social media space. They're way more comfortable in social media. We've seen several student athletes graduate and turn into social media influencers, (laughs) or they've shifted their careers and gone into some kind of marketing and promotion because they got so into NIL. And I think that that's been really cool too. I think they're capitalizing on the moment and they're seeing I can take this and shift it to my life after my sport. Wow. Working with me now. I have a former athlete who's she started working with me because she got into NIL and wanted to stay in sports. And now she's like, this is really cool. I did not think about any of this. And, you know, I just think their their eyes are being open to so much more. The doors at NIL continues to open. Um, It's eye opening for me. So if I'm just like taken back by all of this, I'm being educated while we're having this conversation. But I want to switch gears just for a moment, Taylor. You are a pure example of I can do it all. I've had an opportunity to look at your social media, your website. Uh, You do a lot of things very, very well from being the NIL guru at LSU. You are a former athlete, a tennis player at Auburn. You're a mommy, you're a wife, you're a fashionista. Uh, You're into interior design as well. We talk about being able to do it all a lot here on About Time, but there are some women who may feel like they're very limited For those women who feel like they are not able to do what they love to do, their desires, um, also commit to a career and have a family at the same time, what is some advice you have for those women? I think my biggest piece of advice is, well, I guess two things. One, don't let fear stand in the way of you trying it. And two, don't let someone else write the script for you. I think before I had my little boy, I... I was terrified to be a mom and I had absolutely no idea how I would move up in the world of college athletics and be a mom and be able to, you know, give the time to my student athletes. And that was before I took on NIL. So I was in a much more laid back role in athletics when that was happening. And, you know, there's no right time. Everyone will always say there's no right time to become a mom. And we finally jumped into it. And right after I came back to work, I took on NIL. So work really increased. And the support that you will find is incredible. Uh, the women within athletics who who gather around me, not only the women, the men too. I have a ton of men support, just support in general of people who will come and gather around you and help you navigate when my son's school is closed and he has to come watch his iPad in my office because I have meetings. Like I will have coworkers come and take him down the hall and go take him to shoot hoops. And it's, it, that is going to happen. And if, if it's not happening, then maybe you're not in the right space, you know, like don't, don't be fearful of it because somebody has created this narrative that you can't work and be a mom too. I mean, I'm pregnant with our second one right now. And I'm terrified. I say all the time. Congratulations. Thank you. I say all the time, you know, when I'm on maternity leave, y'all can still call me. And everyone's like, no, like take your maternity leave. It's going to be fine. But I think it's because I have this narrative of they can't do it without me. Well, yes, they can. I have the staff that I've trained. They're incredible. They can do it without me. And it's going to be fine. And everyone's going to be here when I get back. The world is going to continue to rotate. That's what I would say is just don't let people write the narrative for you because there's a lot of negativity surrounding, you know, working moms and working moms in sports and women in sports in general that I don't think is fair. And I just think that we need to be out there at the forefront of it and writing our own story, right? Like, I hope that one day I... I'm a deputy AD and my two kids and my husband are with me or maybe even an AD. I don't know. Maybe I won't stop at deputy, but maybe I'm there one day and my two kids and my family are standing behind me and that that's really cool. And, you know, I think, again, I'm here because I have women who were that example for me. My, my senior women administrator at Auburn, when I first started working, she was married with kids and great example. I have several women in the athletics department here. Also with kids, my previous boss who just took the, or last year took the AD job at Nevada, she's an incredible example as well. And I got to watch her accept an athletic director position, literally kids, husband, 
right there with her. And I'm sitting here going, she's a rock star. Like she's really cool. And now my current boss, same thing. Like she supports me. And I think for women to know that other women are out there supporting you and willing to support you and willing to help you through this process, like you write your story and don't be afraid to to go for it because we're going to support you. We're going to all figure it out. It'll all be good. Now, this is a segment where we go into our rapid fire questions. This is the final segment of the show. We're going to ask you a series of questions and you will have five seconds to answer each question. You ready for this, Taylor? Oh gosh, I think so. I'm the most. Yeah. And I'm going to tell you now, (laughs) I'm going to tell you now these questions are coming from every direction. There's no way to be prepared for this, but you're going to pass with flying colors. I believe to the fashionista sneakers or heels sneakers. Ocean or mountains? Ocean. The best social media platform to build your brand? I say Instagram. Mm. When should student athletes begin building and protecting their brand? As soon as they get on social media. Oh, I love it. Now this one might get you in trouble. Auburn football comes to LSU this season. Who you got winning? (laughs) LSU, because yes, that would get me in trouble, but LSU. Yeah, you're going to get a, a, you're gonna get a <laughs> lot of phone calls from Alabama. I'm sorry. Where are you going to be Thank you so much for the insight you provided on NIL Esoterica. Very educational and very much needed. Yeah, thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. Happy 2024 About Time listeners. I'm Marcy Cornegie from Team We Coach. Applications are now open for our premier We Coach NCAA Women Coaches Academy and Academy 2.0. These academies will be held this summer, June 16th through the 19th in Denver, Colorado. You'll want to make sure to get your application submitted by February 2nd. That's just a few short weeks away. Thanks to generous donors and partners like Huddle, Academy scholarships are available to make it possible for coaches with financial need to attend our academies. You can learn more about our academy programs and upcoming events at wecoachsports.org. Again, that's wecoachsports.org. We look forward to seeing you in Denver and future programs and events. Well, that's our show. Thank you for listening. If you would love to hear more episodes like this, be sure to subscribe wherever you get your podcasts and to our YouTube channel. Thanks again. We'll see you next time.